see that uh, actually people are interested in Marx again. And uh, taking the famous adage that uh, our task is not to understand the world, but to change it, um, to come up with uh, ways of thinking which can also help change it, it seems to me to be a very, very hopeful sign that uh, we can actually start to do something rather different uh, outside of the normal ways of doing business. There's a lot of barriers to this. Um, most of us who write in the way that I do face certain kinds of censorship, uh, not overt, but simply no, we're not interested in what you're saying. It's very difficult to get into the general media. Uh, therefore, you have to take a path of subversion and I would like to suggest that we actually consciously think about uh, subversive uh, politics uh, for these times in which we try to subvert the political process, subvert the econ economic process and the like. Um, and part of that came about because some of my students, and it wasn't my idea, uh, said, well, we should put your Marx class on, on the web. Uh, and they did. And they manage the website, and uh, they do a fantastic job with it. And I want to say to all of you that actually, you, you should thank me for that. You should thank them. Uh, they did a wonderful job, and continue to do a wonderful job. And, uh, and they then came to me and said, well, how about volume two? So we're gearing up to do volume two, and, and you know, we'll see what happens after that. I'm not guaranteeing volume three, but I didn't make guarantee volume two either when I did volume one, but that seems where we're going. So I'm very, very heartened uh, uh, by, by all of this. Now, the Enigma book was a book that was written in response to the crisis. Uh, like many other people, uh, I looked at the situation and said, well, what can I say about this crisis that other people are not saying? And uh, what I wanted to say was uh, not being covered, uh, so I wanted to situate this crisis against the background of uh, an understanding of the role of crises in the history of capitalism, a theory of crisis formation, and a, crisis, a theory of how uh, crises unfold and, and what the dynamic, historical dynamic has been in, in order to better understand what we might do in relationship to these processes. Uh, in doing that, I, I sort of reviewed some of the history of how we came out of the last crisis and what role it has played in forming this crisis. And I don't want to go over that uh, here, but there is a way in which uh, the dynamic uh, is not, as it were, uh, a, a casual dynamic or an accidental dynamic. There's a sort of path dependency the development of capitalism, given the way we came out of the 1970s crisis, the sorts of moves that were made by um, capital to, to deal with its problems, uh, which is the center of this particular thing. The big question, therefore, is what moves are capital, is capital going to engage in uh, right now in order to come out of this crisis, and what does that tell us about the next crisis that's going to likely to come down the line? And that's an open kind of question. So, but I need, in order to look at that, I need to think theoretically. And I had to rewrite, as it were, a, a simplified version uh, of my understanding of crisis theory of Marx, which really rests on, fundamentally, on passages in the Gregory Circle where Marx talks about the way in which capital cannot abide limits and cannot abide uh, barriers. It has to circumvent them and transcend them. And that therefore to look at crises as a manifestation of which limits at this particular time have become significant and, and, and actually preempt the others. So instead of thinking of crisis as a uh, formula of a particular kind, we think about the, the, the motion of capital and the barriers it's encountering. And what you see when you use that kind of theoretical perspective is that capital never resolves its crisis tendencies, it never overcomes its inner contradictions. What it does is it moves them around. And it, at one moment, it'll, it'll be, the, the crisis will appear like this and another like that. And 
when you start to look at the circulation process of ca uh, capital, you can start to see uh, various barriers which exist. There are barriers of natural resources, barriers of, of, of organization, of finance, barriers of, uh, of labor supply, barriers in the labor process, barriers in technology and organizational form, barriers in the market. All of them, kind of a particular historical moment, become the source of a crisis. And therefore, when you bypass that particular barrier, you usually end up displacing crisis onto another. I think the crisis of the 1970s was essentially a crisis of labor, both on the shop floor and also uh, in, in, in the market, and, and also politically in terms of labor having power within nation-state configurations and social democratic forms of government, which could put pressure on the social wage. That was the big barrier at that time, and capital had to do something about it. And it did something about it by, in the end, getting rid of that problem by a variety of maneuvers to the point where by the time you get to the mid-1980s, while there continues to be labor resistance, uh, labor, labor resistance, by the time you get to the mid-1980s, capital has access to global labor supplies, is able to move in such a way and deal with labor such that capital, in a sense, it becomes hegemonic and dominant, and, and labor has less power of resistance. But that then generated another crisis, which is the beginnings of a crisis of effective demand, which is then solved by actually getting people to have their credit cards out and, and you start to get the construction of a, a debt economy which is going to solve the effective demand problem. And the debt economy led to a huge increase in, in household indebtedness, particularly in the United States, but also in many other parts of the world. But if you have the rising household indebtedness of wages are not increasing, and they were not after the 1970s very much at all, then at some point or other that system becomes unstable. And we're right now in a situation where that uh, crisis is, is, is on us. It's a, it's a crisis of effective demand and a crisis in the financial system, which is managing the effective demand. And it appears now more as a crisis of un under consumption rather than a profit squeeze crisis as it appeared to be back in the 19, uh, 1970s. So this is what I mean by rethinking the way in which we understand the role of crises and how crises occur. So part of what I'm doing in the book is going over that. But then even more important to me was not simply going over that, which is, which is in, a, in, a, in a way is, is also dealt with in the final chapter of the companion to, to Marx's Capital, to start to look at what I call a theory of uh, evolution of capitalism, the dynamics of, 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 cap of transformation of capitalism. And there I use this, this figure, which uh, I make much of in the Marx Capital uh, book, which is the importance of this footnote, uh, which begins, uh, which is the beginning of chapter 15 on machinery and, and, and large-scale industry. And there Marx makes uh, some kind of comments about his general mode of approach to, to the problem, and you see him making an argument of different moments in the social process which hang together in a dialectical kind of way. And as I recounted in the Marx book, I, I, I used this when, when I was involved in a, a jury to decide on new designs for a city, a city in South Korea. And we had all these designs, and we said, well, all right, what, we, what criteria do we use? And the jury was made up of uh, engineers, planners, but it was dominated by a couple of architects, urbanists, like so Isazaki and Winnie Maas, and they immediately got into a huge kind of this debate on the relative significance of circles and squares uh, as symbolic and but also having the capacity to absorb things. And this was all about the design. Should we design the city in a circular way or should we do it in squares? I mean, it was a very interesting argument. Some point or another, I said, look, I think there's some other issues we should be looking at, some other questions we should be asking. And I said, for instance, one of the questions we should be asking is what kind of technologies should we be embedding in this city? Uh, both in terms of transport and communications and production and all those particular household technologies and waste and recycling technologies, all those kinds of things. So what kind of technologies are we going to be embedding? And then I said we should also be considering what relation to nature are we imagining for this city and how should that be set up? Should it be about aesthetic choice because it turned out the South Koreans would rather love the tops of their hills so you could build Medi Mediterranean hilltop villages there that would get very upset about that for cultural kind of aesthetic reasons. 
But then there are also questions about the carbon footprint and, and, and all the rest of it, and, and, uh, and so on. And the third issue was, what was daily life like going to be in the city? How about the reproduction process and the, uh, raising kids and, and schooling and, and access to entertainment and enjoyment? So daily, it was a daily life criteria. What would this be like? There was a question of what kind of production systems were going to be in the city. And it turned out the city was going to be a satellite city of uh, the, the government in Seoul. And the result of that would be that it's basically going to be the employment structure is going to be uh, made up of bureaucrats and scientific technical kind of expertise and all the rest of it. And but alongside of that, there are some possibilities. There are all sorts of industrial industries that relate to publications and and, and design of uh, brochures and all those kinds of things, so you can imagine an industrial complex which would also build the adult in relationship to this. And then there was a question of what kind of social relations we were looking at. Given what they were going to put there, it looked to me like it was going to be a god awful boring city with a scientific technical elite that would be there and they would disappear in Seoul and have their pleasures in Seoul. So one of my solutions to that was I suggested they should bury all the ministerial buildings behind the hills so you couldn't see them and make something else that would be more amusing and therefore a draw for people from the surrounding region to come and actually uh, enjoy themselves. So there were issues of, of, of social relations, and gender relations, uh, of, uh, the service population versus the, the, the scientific, technical, bureaucratic elite, all those sorts of questions which have to be looked at. And finally, there were issues of mental conceptions. <coughs> what kind of ideas were we expecting people to Form in this particular in, in this particular environment, and what symbolic values were going to be attached to the city. It was clear that the Koreans had this idea that what they wanted to do <coughs> was to build a city that was going to be actually speak to Asian urbanism in general. It was going to be a model city, if you like, uh, for Asian urbanism. And so they had a symbolic kind of concern about what this city was going to be about. So I said, well, we should put all of those things together and then look at the look at the designs we've been given and think about how they work through these sorts of things. So for instance, there was one wonderful design that I liked very a lot, which said, let the floodplain in the middle of the city flood. And I thought, yeah, well that would mean you leave this the floodplain empty, except for, you know, when it wasn't flooding, you could use it for recreational purposes and the like, but wouldn't it be spectacular to have an occasional flood with the floodplain? That was a great idea. No, no, but, you know, people said, oh, well, that might be interesting. Yeah, so, so those kinds of things. So people talked about this for a little while and then said, you know, this is a very interesting way of looking at it, blah, blah, blah. And then after a while, one of the architects got up and said, yeah, this is all very well, but actually the most important thing, the mental conceptions and the symbolic meaning of squares and circuits. <laughs> so we got back to that again. So at the dinner that night, they said to me, you know, this is, this is very interesting what you're coming up with. Um, you know, have you written this out? Where did you get the idea from? And I said, well, it's a footnote in chapter 15 of Marx's Capital, Volume 1. Now, there's two things happen to you when you say that. One is people think, oh my God, the spectre has entered the room. <laughs> and they look over their shoulder as if Marx is hovering over them like this, and their jobs are being threatened, and their life, and their livelihoods are being threatened, and everything else. People get incredibly nervous. And they really do, they get really, really terrified. Uh, you know, I mean, it was really interesting. The other thing is they look at you as if you're a complete idiot. And the reason they would do that is because, you know, they look at you as if you say, you know, we thought you were an intelligent, free-thinking person, and all you could do is go around citing marks. Even worse, you're citing footnotes of marks. <laughs> so the conversation ended at that point. Maybe I was going to talk about it. But I thought this was a very interesting idea, and I've added some, uh, some things to this uh, in, in the book, talking about institutional arrangements and institutional forms. And said, so what we have to look at is how society works dialectically across all of those moments, about relations to nature, technology, and social relations, or production. And we have to see a revolutionary movement as something that actually moves across all of those. That you don't stick with one and say, ideas change the world. That's all that matters. And actually, there's a lot of social theorists who say that. Or other people say, technology changes the world. Like Mr. Flat Earth, Tom Friedman kind of says that. And, 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 and so you get these single bullet interpretations in much of so social science, which suggest that only one of these things is going to change the world. When it seems to me what Marx is saying is, and when you read the chapter on machinery in this lens, what you see is that actually all of these elements are co-evolving. And I see Marx actually developing a theory of the co-evolution 
of all of these elements in society. And if you then ask yourself the question, how did all of these elements hang together back in 1970? How did it look? What were the social relations like? What were the technologies? What was the relation to nature? How was that conceived? And remember, this was a period of the first Earth Day, too. And, and, and how are the production systems and so on? So all of those things hang together in a certain kind of way. And, and then they change. Then they change, and we live in a very different world now. Those things are hanging together in a very different way right now than they were in 1970. What this says to me is not only was a transition from feudalism to capitalism a move across all of those dimensions, but that capitalism has been a permanently revolutionary force actually transforming all of those dimensions. And as it does so, what it does is it often generates tensions and crises. And the crises are usually crises which are embedded in that process of social transformation. So I then took this idea and then said, well, what does this tell us about what we must do if we're interested in a revolutionary transformation away from capital? And we're going to talk about some alternative society, call it communist or whatever you want to call it, and it's going to be not organized along capitalist lines. And there are two issues that arise immediately then. What is the impelling reason why we must make that, that transition? And it seemed to me, well, in the analysis, that there are the usual ones, like, you know, about inequality, about environmental degradation, all the usual ones which we know, but there's another impelling reason, which when I look back at what's happened since 1970 became much clearer to me, which is that a compound growth rate of 3% per annum is not feasible. We have reached an inflection point in which that 3% compound growth is not workable. And actually, if you look back, you see it was not workable after 1970 either. More and more capital went into fictitious activities. It went into asset markets. It went into all kinds of other things. In other words, instead of going into real production and, and, and making real things which are useful to people, it went into inventing things like derivatives markets, currency futures markets. And now, of course, we're inventing another one to solve the environmental problem, which is the carbon trading market. So we keep on inventing fictitious markets. And actually, if you go back and you list for yourself, how many new markets were invented since 1970? Markets in which capital could play and accumulate vast amounts of personal wealth at the expense of all of us. And it turns out, when you look back, you see this. This is there. It was going on. It was going on in all these new markets. Not only talking about privatization of everything, we're also talking about the invention of these new asset markets and so on, and commodity futures markets. I mean, I love the weather forecast one market. It's great, actually. And you really could enjoy that one. So here's, so here's what capital has done. And what we have to do is, therefore, to recognize that 3% growth is not possible forever. And I was at BBC program today, and I turned to these kind of other journalists, and I said, do you think 3% compound growth forever is possible? And they looked absolutely shocked. Nobody would ask that question. And they kind of say, well, oh, well, maybe. I don't know. I'm, well, yeah, well. <laughs> but, but this is a conversation we've got to have. Because if you think it is possible, then it seems to me you've got some real big explanations to to say how it will be possible. It's, the only way it's possible is by inventing even more fictitious markets. And, and, and they will then, you know, but <coughs> this is something that has to change and is bound to change which then gets you into the whole kind of question of how to, how to think about how to organize the anti-capitalist trade and transition. And I wrote a piece about that for the World Over the Forum and it's on the web and maybe you've seen it. And that is about the last couple of chapters in here, which is about, about how you organize for that, how you use this theory of co-evolution as a theory of co-revolution, and turn the co-evolutionary transformation to a co-revolutionary transformation, and what kinds of alliances are going to be necessary for that to happen, and how can those alliances be built? That seems to me to be one of the ideas. Now, what I'm doing here is laying out a scenario as a basis for discussion and debate. My hope is that it's going to get through the censorship in some way or other, and I'm very delighted with the way this is being set up by my publishers. I want to thank uh, Profile Press and all the folk around who have been helping me a lot on this. And I think we can get somewhere by breaking through that, 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 that ceiling that says we cannot discuss these issues. We cannot discuss the alternative to capitalism. We have to discuss it. 
I don't know what all of the answers are, I'm sure you don't I know them either, but we have to discuss it and we have to work at it. And that seems to be the fundamental message of the book, to try to do that in a way which people can readily understand and start to think about the alternatives. And if we don't think about the alternatives now, we will get an alternative, and it will be a capitalistic alternative, and it looks to me like it seems like, like it would be even more horrendous than the one that we really most recently be going through. So I'm going to stop here and then turn it over to you to sort of uh, give your thoughts on these, on these things. So thanks very much. That was a, a fascinating talk. I have a, a question really, which um, you raised the question of the barriers to capital. And I think that's a correct starting point, but Marx singles out in particular uh, one particular barrier to capital, which he calls somewhere the most important law in all political economy. Uh, and that's specifically what he identifies as the main problem of capital, the long-term tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Um, and I wonder if you could say a bit more about that, because it seems to me that's a particularly important barrier, because if capitalism is all about growth and accumulation, then a limit that flows out of accumulation, which then in turn limits future accumulation, seems to be a, a fundamental problem within the system. And it's one that occasionally finds its way into the mainstream. So in the Financial Times recently there was a column which talks about the rate of, the rate of return on capital falling from 15% in the post-war period through down to just 5% today. You talked also about the growth of the financial system, but for me that can only really be understood um, if you look at the difficulty that capitalism has faced in trying to extract profits from the real economy in recent years. And that has led to a massive shift into the markets and fictitious capital, which exploded. That was the first thing. Um, and I wonder if you can say a bit about that. But the second thing really was just about the impact of the crisis politically, because you talk about this transition. But one of the things that seems very important to me is that we see the crisis coming and it, it's clear to me that the crisis has got a very long way to run still today. It's very easy to be daunted by the crisis. In Britain they're talking about 40 billion pounds of cuts that will have to come and one in ten public sector work has been sacked as a response to that. One of the things I think is very important to me is it's not just our side that faces difficulties in crisis. The political implication as well is also to turn against each other the people in the ruling class, the top of society, to pose them with insoluble contradictions and force them to fight among themselves. And when you talk about our ideas breaking into the mainstream, for me it's very important to say that those divisions at the top of society in a crisis also begin to create the space where those of us from below can begin to put forth our political alternatives. I've just um, bought a copy of your book, and uh, I've just underlined a, a very important um, uh, paragraph, uh, sentence here. Um, I think that I've not seen anywhere else, actually. You say, rent has to be brought forward into the forefront of the analysis. You have quite a lot to say about the land issue, um, but I had, having this quick scan through the, um, your final chapter about the solutions, um, you make no mention of what, the, what you think the solution to that is, and I wonder whether you've actually looked at the Henry George solution, which is collecting uh, rent for the benefit of the whole community. Yeah, I mean, um What, what I don't want to look at right now are different modes of property ownership other than private property ownership, different modes of common property ownership or associated population ownership, um, and uh, taking land out of, uh, not treating land as a commodity. Um, so yes, so I think there's a very important issue about how land is treated, and we're hitting that uh, with uh, things like in what ways can we respond to the foreclosure crisis, for example. Um, the US Social Forum is occurring in Detroit, and one of the arguments they're suggesting is that those of us who have some money should go to Detroit and buy a house, since you can buy houses in Detroit for about $2,000 or something, and then we should donate them to some kind of collective organization that is going to allow people to get their rent free, and, and this is kind of 
uh, these, these are the sorts of moves that it seems to me that it's possible, possible to make. So the whole kind of land question, and, and yeah, Henry George was, uh, you know, had a whole argument about that, and I think that it's part of the story, but Henry George was not opposed to capital, he was opposed to, to, to rent, and I think that the rent part of it is significant. I think Marxists have tended to underplay the rent side of things. Um, if you ask yourself the question, who are the very, very rich people in China right now, and what did they make their money on? They either made it property development and land development, or they made it on resources. Uh, in other words, they're rentiers. And, and the rentier class has become very powerful, and actually in British history, the rentier class has been far more important than I think most of us have uh, actually acknowledged, and so this is something we need to take account of. On the question of the falling rate of profit, yeah, the profit rate falls, but the question is why does it fall? And one way, one way it can fall is because of, believe it or not, underconsumption. That will produce a falling rate of profit. Another way it can, hold, it can fall is because of uh, the increasing share of wages and the national income, the profit rate can fall. Now, in Marx, there is that theory about rising organic composition of capital and all the rest of it, which has a very specific, is a very specific meaning to where crises come from, and they come from a falling rate of profit. You've got to remember that Marx is always in dialogue with classical political economy. And what he was really addressing there was Ricardo's theory of the falling rate of profit. Uh, Ricardo attributed the falling rate of profit to diminishing returns in agriculture. And as Marx says of Ricardo, when faced with a crisis, he took refuge in organic chemistry. That actually, it, it's not an equity. So what Marx wanted to do is to say, well, if there's a falling rate of profit, it is not from, from, from outside forces and outside constraints, it is something that's internalized within the capitalist system. And he came up with this particular way of explaining it in terms of rising organic composition of capital. Frankly, I don't think the theory works. I really don't. I have a real difficult time figuring out exactly how you measure the organic composition of capital, what it means. And by the way, when you look at this, there's a really, really interesting kind of question. At what point does fixed capital become, if you like, second nature, which then is actually earning rent, as opposed to, you know, paying, I mean, so most of the, most of the things around us, and so you could get actually a falling rate of profit because the wrong dealers are extracting too much. So I wanted to have a much more fluid view of crisis formation, rather than simply attaching it to this notion of a rising organic composition of capital. I just don't believe that theory. I've worked at it, tried to figure it out, I was skeptical about it and, and minister capital, and here I'm sort of downright skeptical about it. Uh, I, I just don't see how that works. I see how one of the ways in which you can actually create a crisis is indeed by technological innovations which remove labor from the production process and therefore diminish value flow. Yes, I can see that occurring, but there are plenty of, as Marx says, when he starts, when he really starts to go into it, he says it's the most important law, but when he starts to talk about counteracting forces of the law, by the time you've gone through all the counteracting forces from foreign trade to, to uh, particularly inventing, coming up with new lines of production and, and, and inventing new systems and actually going into capital saving uh, uh, technologies as opposed to labor saving technologies, you pretty soon have a, such a battery of forces which you ranged against it that it can't be a law and as you know he changed his, his language into tendency and remember, volume three is not a completed thing. It was a, 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 a search, it was a search process that was going on. So I went, actually, when I, I went back and was, it really struck me, I prefer the formulation of the good reason about all of these different barriers which exist. And what are the most important ones? Is it, is it labor? Is it the labor process? Is it, you know, is it indeed the patterns of technological change which are disrupting the system? Is it under consumption? Which one is it? And I think historically, it's very, very difficult to make that theory work. And if there was a tendency to the rate of profit to fall, and it began in, say, 1820, why, has it, why is it still there? I mean, I mean, you know, people choose a date and then show some data on, on profits falling or something, but if you, if you look at profits falling in, 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 in manufacturing, yes, in manufacturing from the 1970s, 80s onwards, Profit level in manufacturing was very low, but that had a 
lot to do with excessive competition. That's another great way in which, by the way, the profit rate can fall. It's because fierce competition forces it down. In the 1980s, fierce competition internationally is driving the rate of profit down. Profit margins are very low. Wages are very low. We have a low wage, low profit margin economy, which then poses quite a problem. Uh, like I said, the effective demand problem starts to kick in, and that's where the financial stuff uh, really starts to come from. So uh, for me, also, there are some real problems with the way in which Marx set this up. Marx did not want to deal with the questions of distribution before he had dealt with the realms of production. Uh, what that meant is you read right the way throughout capital, and the question of where the initial money comes from is left in abeyance. Volume 1 doesn't deal with that question. It basically says, well, imagine there is an initial chunk of capital. And when you go through a bit, it kind of says, well, primitive accumulation created the initial capital. But there's a continuous problem in the history of capitalism about how you assemble the capital in such a way that that capital is available in the right place, the right time, and the right quantities to set capital in motion, building you know, a railroad, or, or setting up a factory, or a plant, or something like that. How do you get it from here to China? How do you get it from here to the Marquilla zone? You cannot actually analyze the circulation of capital without actually looking at the institutional arrangements which set up the possibility of assembling capital that way. And actually, if you look at the history of capitalism, every phase of it has been involved in financial innovation to solve that question. The huge innovation that occurred in the 1970s and 1980s in the financial architecture of the global system had a lot to do with giving capital the liberty to flow freely from one part of the world to another. And but when when capital needs the financial system to do that, and a new financial system to do that, it means the financiers are empowered. And indeed the financiers get greedy and greedy and they start taking more and more of a cut. You look at the figures on financial corporation profit rates, the share of, of, of profit in the United States uh, which is going to financial corporations versus manufacturing. The financial corporations were going like that, manufacturing was going like that. They were taking a bigger and bigger share. Yes, they were getting greedy. And they got extra greedy, and they're getting even greedier. So there is that, that side of it. Now, on this issue, are, are the capitalists kind of uh, in, in, in trouble? Yes, they are in trouble amongst themselves to some degree. But notice something. Uh, the, real, the real, quote, masters of the universe, as they like to like to call themselves earlier, are still consolidating their power. There's an immense centralization of political power occurring, particularly in the United States. And I saw something in the newspaper yesterday, there's some survey of wealth in this country, and people got extremely rich. The rich got much richer last year. Everybody else got poorer. And in the United States, just two, three weeks ago, the leading hedge fund owners got three billion apiece in one year. This is, not, this is not them having a hard time. And there's a great line from Andrew Mellon back in about 1912, who kind of said, in a crisis, uh, assets return to their rightful owners, i.e. him. And, this is, and, and actually, they're making, they're making mints out of this crisis. And actually, this is going on all around the world. The number of billionaires in India doubled last year from around 27 to 52 or 53, something like that. So actually, there's a consolidation of immense financial power going on. And I don't see those guys falling out with each other very much. And what I'm watching in Washington right now is an attempt to reform the banking system, which is ostensibly against the party of Wall Street. But on the other hand, the party of Wall Street is managing the process with a kind of low symbolic politics about how, you know, greedy uh, Goldman Sachs is and everybody's being populist now and we hate the banks and we should regulate them and do nasty things for them. But you can be sure they're not going to do anything to those big banks which is really going to hand, handcuff them in any serious way. You can be absolutely sure of that, the way the things are going. So I don't see, I don't see the capitalist class falling out at this particular point. Maybe in some parts of the world they are. I certainly don't see it happening in the United States. I see they're actually consolidating their power and consolidating their interests politically. And of course, it works differently in the United States because the power of money in elections is, is far vaster than it is here. I mean, it's bad here, but it's, it's absolutely appalling in the United States. So yeah, there may be, there may be some gaps in, in what they're doing that can be exploited. 
Uh, but I think that actually right now we're seeing a consolidation of capitalist class power rather than a fracturing of capitalist class power, which is not to say there aren't some divisions that can be utilized. So my view on that is uh, politically, we are in a, probably in a worse situation right now in terms of the consolidation of capitalist class power than we were going into the crisis. The only thing that's going to counteract that is indeed a mass mobilization, a populist mobilization, a mass mobilization. That's the only thing that's going to counter it. And in the United States, at least, people are really pissed off about the banking system. They really are. There is a lot of populist outrage. Um, I don't hear it in this country. I haven't noticed it in this country to the same degree. Uh, and uh, we have, I think, uh, uh, you, know, you have a, a different set of political responses here than we have in the United States. There is populist outrage, as there was in the 1930s, by the way. There's a long history of uh, populist outrage against the banks and the financial institutions, and that is ratcheting up right now. And it even includes the Tea Party, you know, so it actually consolidates uh, things. So even the Tea Party, which is against state intervention, is in a situation where it says, we want state intervention, which is a contradiction in what they're talking about in healthcare. Right? You know, so Obama has been very astute, by the way, in moving from healthcare debate, which is very divisive, to something where he knows the populist sentiment is on his side, and he's putting, the, he's putting the Republicans in a very hard place right now um, for that very, very simple kind of tactical reason, which is why you're seeing a real push for financial reform in the United States, but I don't see any push occurring in this country, and I don't see any, uh, any, any sign of, of a major kind of overhaul. I don't think any of the major politicians are talking about this, uh, and we're likely to see something happen in the United States precisely because of the political conjunction. We have to use these political conjunctures creatively if we can. I'd just uh, like David to quickly share his thoughts on the issue of uh, world imperialism and the labour aristocracy in the West. Uh, I'm just picking up on the point that uh, David made about how capital overcame its barriers in the 1970s. Uh, because it seems to me that one of the big ways capital overcame its barriers, as David says, was um, world capital market liberalisation, which increased the flow of um, imperialist capital into the third world countries. And what we saw then was that there was an increased flow of manufacturing goods from third world countries to the first world countries, such as Britain, and this flow of cheap goods underwrote the living standards of the working class, um, and it underwrote the rise of the service sector, which absorbed a lot of the redundant manufacturing workers. Um, and I mean, it's worth noting, unlike America and Britain, I mean, living standards went up after the 1980s recession. They went, the, the real wage went up quite strongly. Um, and I mean, isn't it the case that given this kind of labour aristocracy that exists in the West, that's underwritten by the sort of the labour and exploitation of the third world, that really the storm centres of the world revolution are, are in general terms at the moment in the third world. We've seen revolutions in Latin America over the last few years, which have installed into reforms, but there were revolutions. And also we've seen revolutionary movements in India, and we hope that our African comrades will, will, will be able to make revolution too. I mean, isn't, isn't this, I mean, I'd just like to know David's opinion on this important strand of, of, of Marxist thinking. Um, my question relates to, I'm interested in, in the links between capitalism and um, ecology. And in particular, I'd be interested to hear your views on capitalism's complicity and reliance on so-called natural disasters or ecological crises. And I'm thinking, for example, the um, devastating impacts of the earthquake in Haiti and the implications that this has for your proposed solution of um, mass mobility to counter its effects. Okay, uh, two points in a question. Um, first point, I don't want to make a big deal of it, but I was a bit puzzled, David, by what you said about the tendency of the rate of profit to fall and uh, the counter tendencies that Marx talks about, because in a way the interrelationship between the two very much fits in with what you were talking about, um, the dynamic co-evolution of different aspects of, of capitalism. The way I see it is that it's the interaction uh, between the tendency of the rate of profit to fall and the different country tendencies that shapes the whole historical trajectory of capitalism. But, you know, one can get a bit theological on the question of the falling rate of profit, so that's all I want to say about that. Second point, 
I mean, it's absolutely true, and it's really astonishing to see how in the US and, and Britain, certainly, the banks that have survived the crisis have emerged bigger and stronger and more assertive. But it's, it, it's all dependent upon the way in which the state stepped in to rescue them, and in particular, the way in which um, the central banks pumped money into the financial system that essentially allows the banks to continue to make enormous, absolutely spectacular profits, essentially on the basis of public money. I mean, George Soros put it very well when he said that the banks' profits are now gifts from the, the government. And I think one interesting question then is how the, both the banks and the state disentangle themselves from that, that relationship. I mean, there's a very powerful drive going on, certainly in Europe, to make define this as a problem of public debt. In other words, the state borrowed all the, this money in order to save the banks. The banks now respond in outrage, saying this is terrible, all this, all this borrowing that's going on, and therefore we need savage cuts in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the public sector, which is both an indication of the kind of the strength of the banks, but it does open up potential fractures both to the extent that the public debt crisis creates problems as it is, for example, in the Eurozone, but also when the severity of the cuts evoke resistance, as is very clear in the case in Greece. So I'd be interested to hear what you thought about that. The question I wanted to ask is, okay, you think that the, so the capitalist class in the US is relatively united in its response to the crisis. What about fractures at the, the global level? I mean, there's much discussion of the, the tension between, among the big economies, among debtor states like the US and Britain and so on, and smaller, smaller examples of that, like Greece and Portugal, and the creditor states, the big exporting economies, like China and Germany on the other. And I'd be interested to know what you think about these particular fractures and tensions, because they seem very important in shaping what is described as the recovery from the crisis. Okay, um, on, on the question of uh, imperialism, you know, I had a long-running argument with uh, Giovanni Righi as to whether it's better to use uh, a language about shifting hegemonies uh, rather than imperialism. And I'm still kind of a bit of two minds about that um, because I think there is well, the sort of truth to, to what you're talking about, um, there is a very clear way in which wealth is no longer piling up in the United States and Europe uh, and to some extent Japan. There is a dispersal of some of that wealth, particularly to China, even to countries like India. And we're seeing uh, a shift of uh, the flows, if you like, uh, in, in, in which uh, Chinese surpluses are, are surging into Africa in search of uh, raw material resources and land and all this kind of thing. And there's a complicated situation right now in which it's not clear to me exactly how we would use a, a, a unified or a unitary notion of, of, of imperialism which is located, clearly located. Uh, in that sense, I think, well, Hart maybe got a lot of things wrong. I think the intuition is right that we should be talking about a more dispersed understanding of, of who's gaining and whose expense. Uh, right now, of course, the, the, the Chinese are booming along at about seven or you know, ten percent uh, growth. Uh, Europe is in stagnation. So I'm, I'm not. It's not clear to me that that the, if you like, the, the traditional theory of the imperialism. Uh, works quite as well as it did, say, in post-1945, uh, and, and right now it's a, it seems to be it's a much more complicated picture, which has a lot to do also with the whole way in which globalness has been financialized and who can extract wealth from whom and doing what. And there's a lot of counterflow and counter-movement going on, and I think we should recognize uh, what that's uh, uh, about. Now, some of this counter-move relates to the question on kind of ecological, the way in which uh, 
the relation to nature act is in here, and and uh, the utilization of uh, elements of this of this kind. Um, but what I, I think you have to do is 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 I don't like the idea that somehow or other disasters are natural. Uh, the, the collapse of Haiti was not a natural disaster in any ordinary sense. It was humanly created. And in fact, has in many respects, I mean, it's astonishing to me that suddenly we get this big launch of appeal to the people in the United States to go help out, uh, you know, donate money to Haiti. And you say, you've been ripping that place off for about the last, you know, 200 years. And now or suddenly you're turning around saying you're the good guys because you're going to give some money to the poor folk in Haiti because of the earth earthquake. I mean, that was not a natural disaster. It was a social disaster which was triggered by a natural event. And it's very interesting. The strength of that earthquake was, you know, was no great, in fact it was less than the Chilean earthquake. Yet, what happened in Chile was not the same thing at all. And it was not taken up in the same way at all. In other words, uh, you know, it, it's like when hurricanes hit. If it, it, if it hits in the United States, there are very few deaths. If it hits in Central America, there are lots of people get killed. I mean, actually, we used to stop calling things and went, when the earthquake hit in Managua, we stopped calling it an earthquake, and we called it a class quake. Uh, and, and I think that you have to, 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 to say that actually the vulnerability to natural disasters is not something that is, uh, that is, that is natural. It is about how society is organized. And then what happens afterwards is often, yeah, society zooms in and starts to actually behave in a very predatory way in relationship to those events as they did in New Orleans. And as uh, you start to see around you know, what happened with the tsunami or, and so on. So, you know, yes, there's a great deal of, 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 of capitalist opportunism that uh, jumps on the back of the disaster and says this is a great opportunity for us uh, to try to do, um, to do what we want to do. Um, on, on the crisis, you know, um, one of the things I'd like to mention here, because maybe it's not getting the coverage you might want to give it, is that the biggest failed state in the world right now is not Greece, but it's California. Uh, California is a disaster area in terms of its public expenditures. It really is. And the, the, the UC California's uh, uh, education system is being savaged with cuts. And people are being put on furlough, and people are being laid off, departments are being closed down, and actually students are reacting. So there's a student movement there that is very rigorously reacting to this. And these cuts, I mean, your people are worried about cuts to come, well, you want to see what the cuts are like, then go to California and see what's happening. It's really, really, really serious. And, and uh, the political response to this is, 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 of course, uh, something that you can hope will begin to morph into something that is very much more general. But this actually goes back to my, my point, that capital doesn't sit quiet in crises, it moves them around. And it moves them around both geographically and from one point to another. To the degree that state, the states, and particularly the central banks, have stabilized the global financial system to some degree and actually, actually returned it to profitability, such that we are told because they have returned to profitability and because the stock market is going up, the crisis is over. You say, well, there's an incredible, you know, there's an incredible bias in, in that definition of the crisis being over. The unemployment crisis is not over. The savage cuts that are occurring and, and we're just about to see them unfolding. I mean, you know, New York is about two years behind California, so they're like to see New York go down in the tubes in a couple of years too. too. So these, these cuts are already in motion, big time, and they're already in motion in Greece, and we are seeing public responses to them. And I think there will be even more public responses as the cuts start to go. But people notice what we're doing. We're doing what the neoliberal thing was about all along, at least as I understood it, which is that when, you're, when you've got a conflict between the well-being of the people and the well-being of financial institutions, you choose the well-being of financial institutions. Absolutely. 
and you sold it to the people. I mean, that's what happened to the IMF discipline of uh, uh, Mexico in 1982. And that's what every IMF program has always been about. Uh, and and, and the, what happened in Latin America was really interesting. I mean, when the crisis hit the United States, the Brazilians in particular were jumping up and down and saying, yay, finally the United States is experiencing the equivalent of an IMF program of structural readjustment. Yay, good, better now getting a terms of what it's like. And of course they said, well, it should have, this shouldn't happen years ago, but you know, of course it didn't because uh, the United States is the IMF. So you know, kind of have a problem about that. Um, I, I agree with you, Alex. The, the, the big divisions right now uh, are not between, say, a capitalist class and as, it, as, it, as its development, as its role is, is emerging in, 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 in the United States, but the fractions are within the G20. And I think that to the degree that there are, those are frac factions, initially there was some impulse to try and pull together. Uh, but after that, they began to sort of fall apart in terms of uh, collective uh, action around it. But I think you also have to recognize that the world's central bankers are in very close communication with each other. I mean, we're moving into a situation where, in fact, we're living under the dictatorship of the world's central central bankers. And, and uh, they're the ones who have the power, and they can actually do all these things like, you know, Produce the money, which then puts the state into into, into hock and creates the, the fiscal crises of, of, of states. But the central banks are absolutely crucial in all of this, and they are subsidizing, of course, the big banks, which are too big to fail. For instance, the, the big banks in the United States are able able to borrow money from the Federal Reserve when they need it at zero percent interest. I mean the big banks, not the small banks, the big banks, the ones that are judged too big to fail, are given access. So they borrow as much money as they like from the Federal Reserve at 0%. And then they lend it out at 5%. I mean this is an enormous subsidy to go to the banks. An enormous subsidy. And you can't say, you know, we've given them enough and they've returned to profit. If they've returned to profitability, which they claim, then we should stop this. But the Federal Reserve shows no kind of inclination to stop this right now. It's, it's keeping it going. It may shut it down eventually, but we have to make a fuss about, uh, about that. So how do you think it's moved around? And then this kind of question. I'm not saying the profit rate doesn't fall. Of course it falls. And then it rises again. But the reason it falls is not necessarily due to some mechanical shift in the organic composition of capital. So I can measure what happens to profit rates and say, yeah, okay, they're falling, and indeed in manufacturing they were falling. But why? Was it because of organic, changing organic composition of capital, or was it because of fiercer and fiercer competition, which led to price competition, which led to lower profit margins? My view of the 1980s was that was what was going on. It had nothing to do with rising organic composition. It had to do with intensifying competition. And back in the 1960s, you had almost monopoly capital around, which, 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 you know, where profit margins could be kept up by simply adjusting prices upwards. That's what profit, you know, that's what a monopoly situation does for you. But you couldn't do that. You had to adjust profit, you had to adjust prices downwards. So you get the Walmart phenomenon and all of those kinds of things. I mean, intensive and excessive competition. And, and actually capitalists start to bleed under these circumstances. It's about excessive competition. The ruinous form of excessive competition. And, and that becomes, as it were, uh, the, big, the big problem. So I think that, that actually that, to me, is, 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 is the sort of thing we have to look at as to why the profit rate is falling. Because if there's not enough effective demand, the profit rate falls. So it could be because there's lack of effective demand. And the great thing about looking at Marx's circulation process as a process, continuous, through its different moments, is that you see very clearly that if you get past this one, then you're going to create something that's a problem here. And then you see it moving around. So I want to see crisis, these crisis tendencies understood as something that moves around in this way, and also, of course, moves around geographically. How many crises have we had since 1973? And the answer is hundreds of them. There were financial crises, fiscal crises of states, there were sometimes you know, particular corporation crises, there was an Enron crisis, there was a new economy crisis. 
I mean, crises have been ten a penny in ways that were not that was not the case in the 1950s and 1960s. You cannot tell me that all of those are due to, say, rising organic composition of capital. No. They are refractions of general processes which are moving into different configurations and moving around geographically. So what we have to do is, I think, reconfigure the way in which we're thinking about crisis and get away from this idea that you're either a fall of rating, rate of profit person or you're an underconsumptionist. And by the way, if you're an underconsumptionist, you're really a secret Keynesian and therefore not a genuine Marxist. Oh, that's right. And, and you're not a fall, you know, you're not a profit squeezist either, you know. So, I mean, you've got, to, you've got to get out of that kind of debate. You've got to bypass that debate and take a fresh look at where crises come from, how they work. And I'm trying to lay out an alternative framework to understand that. And, and it will be unpopular right now, perfectly well. Everybody's going to jump on me out of the fall of rate of profit. I predicted that. Oh, yeah, and of course, it's, of course I'm going to get that again and again and again. But this is a debate, again, we, 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 we need to have. Um, then there's a question about, you know, what's going to happen with, um, you know, would I elaborate a little bit more on this co-evolution, co-revolution stuff? Well, it's, it's difficult to do in, in, in a few minutes because it's all a complicated story. I mean, the last chapter is about what is to be done and who is going to do it. And, and it really then talks about various, uh, various elements in, in, in a, and I use this co-revolutionary process to say, well, each of us, in our own way, can contribute something to someone. I mean, if I take those seven points and say, what am I competent on? I'm, I, I'm attempting to influence mental conceptions of the world. And Marx does indeed, at some point, say, you know, ideas are a material force in historical change. Doesn't mean he's an idealist, but you're not going to be able to change the world unless people's ideas change. And if you look at a particular issue, you look at, say, an environmental issue, and you say, what are we going to do about this? You can't change it by simply changing the technologies. You can't, in other words, you can't change the relation to nature if that's your problem that you really want to solve. You can't change it without changing the technologies, changing social relations, changing mental conceptions of the world, changing daily life, changing production systems. You've got to change all of those elements if you want to really deal with that problem. And therefore, I'm arguing that those of us who have a certain power or influence on any one of those moments, use them. I mean, there is a big problem right now. Many of you are in the universities where you're being taught a bunch of crap, which is absolutely no interest in helping us understand either how the crisis happened or what to do about it. I mean, and when, you know, Her Majesty the Queen down the road said to the economists there, how come you didn't see this coming? <laughs> And they couldn't give an answer, and when they did give an answer, they kind of said, well, we missed systemic risk. Say, oh, you missed the contradictions of capitalism. <laughs> so I'm trying to fill in and give Her Majesty the answer. I could have a copy of the book and say, here's how it happened. These guys completely missed it. But you're still being, if you're in an economics program, you're still being taught the same stuff as if nothing's changed. The business school is teaching the same stuff, except they're adding a little course on business ethics, as if that happened. <laughs> And then they'll also be adding courses on how to make money out of other people's bankruptcy. <laughs> so, so, you know, there's a, there's a big task for us. We've got to change mental conceptions of the world. And the universities are one of the places to start. And we've got to actually recognize that most of the faculty, you know, I understand you want to defend them, but frankly, I wish a bunch of them would leave. <laughs> because they've been preaching reactionary crap. <laughs> And, and we have to, and, and actually the student movement in the 1960s did change the way in which people thought about the world. We need a student movement that's going to do that. And then you see signs of it in California. You see signs of it around the world. So, but this is not going to create a revolution, okay? The total revolution, there has to be an alliance between what we do in trying to change mental conceptions of the world and get people to understand. We have to actually recognize we have to be in alliance with many of the sophisticated people who are looking at new technologies. And what those new technologies are about, and what they're capable of, and 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 what how they can be used in a revolutionary purpose. And there's a big battle about this going on, of course, over the use of the internet and how the internet is being used. I couldn't have got, got the Marx course out of the way I had had it not been for the internet. So there's a progressive use of it, but we know also there's a lot of reactionary use of it. So there's a whole kind of battle going on over over, over the internet, and whether it'll be closed down. I mean, I suspect if the course becomes too popular. Um, the U.S. will take the you know, advice of the Chinese government and figure out a way to close it down. 
I mean, there's a, there's, there's a real, real, real serious set of questions here which we have to fight. So we can fight in our corner doing what we know how to do best, but we have to find ourselves in alliance with many other people. And as I said earlier, also in my earlier books, I think it's not simply about exploitation of labor in, in the work process. We also have to deal with the, the politics that flows from accumulation by dispossession, the assault upon peasant communities, the assault upon rights, the assault upon uh, capacity, the you know, pension rights and, and health care and all those kinds of things, the assault that's been going on in, in, in housing, the assault that's been going on in transforming our cities into neoliberal paradises where most ordinary people cannot afford to live. I mean, these are the kinds of processes that need to be welded together into a much broader movement. And I have this wonderful fantasy, if you want my sort of utopian fantasy, is we imagine a situation where all of the alienated and the discontented, like me, <laughs> entered into an alliance with the deprived and the dispossessed. And I have some student kind of say, well, actually, I'm alienated, discontented, deprived, and dispossessed. And I say, you're the perfect revolutionary subject. <laughs> And, and so we imagine that, but it has, it has to be a broad alliance around these things. And, and we have to rethink uh, the politics of revolution movements and how they get structured and what the role of political parties might be, what the more move, role of social movements might be, how we might relate to it. So again, this is, this is an invitation to rethink much of our own revolutionary strategy. That to me is part of what I want to sort of launch a dialogue about as well. And finally, on the British election, I have no comment whatsoever. <laughs> I hope you get the best person possible. <coughs> but I have no idea who that is. <laughs>